Thanks for coming today. I'm going to be doing uh, a little bit different type of seminar than I normally do because usually I talk mostly about the science and uh, when Naima invited me to come she wanted me to talk both about the biodiversity research that we're doing as well as the efforts that we've uh, been involved with to promote diversity in the sciences. So it's going to be uh, an interesting mix that I haven't uh, done before so hopefully it works and um, We'll talk uh, both about the work in the Coral Triangle here, as well as uh, at least one of the programs I, I run. And if the timing works out, we'll see. We might be able to talk about uh, both programs. So um, I always start with acknowledgments, because without a whole lot of people, none of this work would happen. And rather than just looking at really tiny names on a uh, slide, I I'd like to just show you some of the people who have contributed to the work that I'll be talking about today. Students uh, from all over the United States, from uh, big schools, from small schools, from the US, from uh, Indonesia, and all over. Um, we've been funded by a, a number of sources. And uh, I always like to, to thank my family as well, because uh, they always come with me to the field. They, they, uh, my son got his first uh, acknowledgement in a paper for collecting snails for one of my graduate students uh, when he was two. Uh, snails that <laughs> my son could find, but my graduate student, oddly enough, could not. Um, so uh, you know, they've been a, a tremendous uh, help over the years and couldn't have done it without them. Um, so uh, evolution of the Amazon of the ocean. What does the Amazon of the ocean mean? Uh, well, we live in a day and age where this may be what immediately comes to mind. Um, but what we're really trying to do is draw a parallel between uh, this region of Southeast Asia where I work and the Amazonian uh, basin, uh, which is the largest, most biologically diverse terrestrial ecosystem in the world. This region known as the Coral Triangle is the largest and most diverse uh, marine ecosystem in the world. Uh, it encompasses six countries, uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. The boundaries are defined by the presence of more than 500 hard coral uh, species um, and encompasses about uh, 6 million square kilometers. Now, 6 million square kilometers is a lot, but in the uh, grand scheme of things, uh, it's a very small portion of the world's ocean, but it has 35% of the world's coral reefs contains 76% of all the sclerotinian coral species in the world. 37% of all the reef fish are concentrated in this very small area of the world's oceans. And in fact, if you look at biodiversity, great, uh, if we plot biodiversity from high to low uh, across this landscape, what we see is that this region in orange, which is the coral triangle, uh, you know, there's areas where there's even higher diversity within the Coral Triangle. So in the Philippines and Indonesia, it's exceptionally high. But as soon as you start moving any compass point away from that global epicenter, biodiversity starts plummeting very, very quickly. And it's hard to really get perspective looking at this uh, map. So what I want to do is, is try to explain this in a different way. Um, you're in Michigan, it's February. I imagine some people go to places like the Caribbean to get a change of weather. Um, and if you go to the Caribbean, there are two species of Acropora hard corals um, that you will see there. Um, and, you know, the Caribbean is viewed as, you know, this by some is, is to be this you know, very diverse marine uh, ecosystem. Um, if, you go out to a single dive site in Indonesia, you can see over 80 different Acropora species just in one single dive site. Within the Coral Triangle, there's more than 100 species. You know, so 50 times more diversity in the Coral Triangle than the Caribbean. So I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude here. It's a big, big difference. Now, there's a couple of reasons that people have proposed for why this is. The first uh, hypothesis, it's the center of overlap, and it draws on the ideas developed by Wallace when he worked in Indonesia. 
Uh, and his, it was his ideas to explain why there is high terrestrial biodiversity here. And he explained it as the overlap of an Asian and Australian terrestrial fauna. And the center of overlap suggests that there's a Pacific fauna and an Indian Ocean fauna. They overlap at this junction between the two oceans, resulting in higher biodiversity in the middle. Others have said that this is a center of accumulation and that diversification happens in the peripheral islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans and that that diversity over time accumulates in uh, the Coral Triangle resulting in higher levels of biodiversity. The center of origin hypothesis is just the opposite. It states that biodiversity is evolving within this biodiversity hotspot and it is being exported to populations in the peripheral islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Now, one of the big issues with this hypothesis has been the notion that there aren't very many barriers to promote speciation in the marine environment. And that's one of the things that we've uh, really been focused on to try to understand this pattern. You know, in order to get high levels of biodiversity, there has to be a lot of speciation happening somewhere. And where is that happening? And how can that inform our understanding of this pattern? Now, there's another pattern that's very important to know about this region. And it is this pattern here, which is uh, the Coral Triangle is an critically endangered marine ecosystem from uh, destructive fishing practices, from pollution, from sedimentation coming from uh, deforestation. If you look at just the Philippines and Indonesia alone, 80% of these coral reefs are considered uh, threatened to highly threatened at this point. Uh, the red dots being highly threatened, the yellow ones being uh, ones that we should be worried about. The blue ones are okay, but you know, we see here the coral triangle is essentially you know, outlined in red. And these threats come from a number of sources. It's, it's coastal development, people building right up to the edge of the sea without any sort of uh, buffer zones. Uh, it's coming from coastal pollution. Here's a nice beach uh, in Bali, nice place to go spend a holiday. Um, bomb fishing, uh, this is a, a relic of the uh, presence of the US Navy in World War II in the Pacific. People learn that when bombs land in the water and explode, um, that fish float to the surface. In fact, a lot of them sink too, but some of them float to the surface. And so uh, people practice this now as a fishing technique, a uh, very unsustainable one and very non-discriminatory one. Uh, other threats are more global at this point. So the vibrant colors that you see in these coral reefs, of course, come from the symbiotic dinoflagellates that are inside the coral's tissues. And um, as ocean temperatures are rising, as corals are becoming increasingly stressed, uh, they bleach, they expel the zooxanthellae that provide 90% of their nutrition. And in many cases, uh, these, these coral reefs uh, cannot recover from severe coral bleaching events, which are occurring on a much greater frequency than any time uh, in our history of, of paying attention. Now, this is important to, to be thinking about because, um, you know, 40% of the world's economy and 80% of the needs of the poor are provided from biodiversity, from these biological resources in these ecosystems. And, you know, if you think about the biological importance of marine biodiversity in the Coral Triangle, you know, all you have to do is, you know, look at this figure here. 663 million people are living within the Coral Triangle, a third of which are depending upon fish as their primary source of protein. Um, if you just take an economic perspective, um, these marine ecosystems are providing jobs for more than 120 million people. Uh, in the Philippines, you know, 2.2% of global fisheries production is producing 8.4% of their GDP. It's coming from the marine environment. In Indonesia, you know, 4.8% of their GDP is coming from the marine environment. And 
you know, 4.8, they're providing 4.8% of the global fisheries production. Now, if we were terrestrial conservation biologists, the thing you would do is you'd say, okay, we have an ecosystem that's really important biologically, uh, economically, you know, what do we do? Let's make a reserve, right? So we do this all the time in, in terrestrial ecosystems. So, you know, don't feed the monkeys, don't go into the game park on a motorbike, um, you know, and watch out for elephants because they will chase your car and tip them over. Uh, I've been chased, I have not been tipped over. Um, so you, you actually do have to worry about this. Um, that was a different PhD project. Um, so we do this in the marine environment. We create uh, marine reserves. You know, you can go swimming, you can go surfing and fishing, but, you know, don't collect lobsters and, you know, no camping and whatnot. And marine protected areas are actually very effective uh, conservation uh, tools. Um, if you compare marine protected areas to non-marine uh, protected areas, what you see is that you get increase of the size, the density, and diversity of the organisms that live there. The other cool thing about marine protected areas is that there's a spillover effect. It's not just limited to the marine protected area itself, but the areas adjacent to the marine protected areas have larger, um, more diverse, uh, more biomass communities uh, than uh, further away. So on the surface, you know, you know, it's all good. You know, let's, let's make marine protected areas a very good conservation tool. Um, they do work. The one challenge is highlighted in the next slide, which is if you're managing a marine reserve like the Masai Mara, uh, where I spent a year doing field work on a failed PhD project, studying spotted hyenas, um, you know, this cute little hyena will grow up to be a big, ugly hyena. Um, and if that big, ugly hyena is a female, she will stay in her natal clan. If it's a male, he will disperse to a nearby clan, but he might disperse as, at most 20, 30, 40 kilometers. Not very far. A small enough area that you can actually put a fence around uh, a game park. You can enclose everything and you can protect everything inside of it because the things inside don't necessarily move really long distances. Now, adults in marine ecosystems don't move long distances either. In fact, most of them don't move at all. Um, you know, because they're attached to the bottom or, you know, they are, they have high site fidelity. So, you know, clownfish will never leave an area the size of this space that I'm uh, standing in right now. Where dispersal occurs is, is uh, during a developmental larval stage. And most marine organisms have a larval stage. And the longer the developmental period is for those larvae going from uh, you know, hours to days to weeks to months, uh, the further those propagules generally disperse. There are some outliers here, but in general, the, further you, the longer you travel, the further you go. And in a lot of cases, these larvae disperse very long distances. So this is some work, uh, some early work by Rudy Sheltema, who sampled um, planktonic communities uh, in a variety of transects of the Pacific Ocean, uh, sorry, the Atlantic Ocean, and the black dots indicate where he found the larval villagers of these coastal marine gastropods. And what you can see is that they're all over. I mean, even though they live on the uh, west coast of Africa, you can find these larvae all over the Atlantic Ocean. And this creates a bit of a problem from a conservation standpoint because larvae don't respect fences. So you can decide that you're going to enclose uh, or protect you know, this, this isolated marine ecosystem. And you, know, you can say, all right, you know, here are these two places that are really spectacular. Um, you know, they're valuable for dive tourism, they're valued for fisheries, whatever they're valued for. You can say that you want to protect these, but if those populations are dependent upon larvae from here, and this population is dependent on larvae from here, and that population is dependent on larvae from here, 
if you don't protect these populations as well, you're not protecting the supply of larvae, and those populations can uh, decline and vanish as you watch. Okay? And this notion of connectivity in marine reserves and how critical this is to marine conservation and doing it successfully, creating sustainable networks of marine protected areas, was identified as one of the, the critical gaps in our science needed to promote sustainable marine environments. Now, the challenge is that there are very few things that are big enough that we can put satellite pop-up tags on to follow. In fact, there are no larvae, you know, even, you know, small little turtles, you know, we have no idea where they go. You know, the tiny little turtles, you know, they're, they're big. Um, and we can't track those. And, you know, most marine larvae are, you know, the size of a grain of rice. And most of them die. You know, a million larvae may be produced and maybe four or five of them survive. And so even if we could track them, the odds of us selecting the right individuals to track are basically zero. So how are we going to approach this? So the approach that we've taken over the years is by using genetics. And so if we're interested in clownfish here, these clownfish you know, live on anemones. These anemones live uh, along the, the coastal reef ecosystems of you know, various islands. And although we generally don't think this way, you know, there is a genealogy of these clownfish. You know, we think about our genealogies a lot. There's you know, all these ancestry.com, and you know, people spend a lot of time thinking about their own genealogies. But very rarely do we think about the genealogy of clownfish. But clownfish have genealogies. And within the genealogical history of these clownfish, mutations occur, and genetic variation uh, is propagated and distributed throughout the environment. So that we can, instead of thinking about these individual clownfishes, we can think about their genealogies and just think about them in terms of genotypes. So we can go out and we can look at genotypes and say, all right, well, you know, type 1 and type 2 are 50% you know, of each of these populations. We can summarize it in a little pie diagram. And the only way that this is going to happen is when there is a lot of genetic exchange that's happening between these populations. And that genetic exchange comes because of larval dispersal. The larvae are the ones that are moving the genes. However, you can get situations where you know, genotype 1 is fixed in population 1 and genotype 2 is fixed in population 2. And that only occurs if these larvae are not exchanged and there's some sort of barrier to dispersal, whether it's ecological, behavioral, uh, geological, you know, these larvae are not making it between these two islands. And because of that, each of these, through the actions of mutation, selection, genetic drift, evolve their own evolutionary trajectories, and we can distinguish these using a variety of, of molecular tools. Fortunately, the kinds of information that we're interested in in terms of marine conservation and the connectivity of marine populations and barriers to connectivity of marine populations is the exact kind of information that helps us understand this pattern here. Because understanding the evolution of the Coral Triangle Marine Biodiversity Hotspot is all about where are the barriers? Where is diversification happening? Where is gene flow sufficiently limited that these populations begin to diverge and ultimately speciate, generating novel biodiversity. And um, so starting with an NSF career grant, uh, we started what is known as the Diversity Project, which we'll talk uh, from a different perspective here uh, in a second. Um, but what we do, the idea of the Diversity Project was to take undergraduates uh, out into the field, teach them to do the field work, bring them back to the lab uh, at that time at Boston, but now at, at UCLA, where they would learn to do uh, molecular population genetics and phylogeography. And the goal was to look at about 72 different uh, species. 
We never got to 72. Uh, we got to about 50. And um, what I want to do is sort of summarize the, the, the patterns that we see because um, if you go into an environment and you sample uh, populations of co-distributed organisms and they all have similar patterns, that's telling you that there must be some sort of mechanism that is limiting gene flow between them and that it's probably something that's affecting all of those organisms in the same way. So we looked at a variety of things from sea stars to giant clams to a variety of marine gastropods, even big things uh, like Spanish mackerel, a, a fish that's about as big as I am. And um, what we see is that if you compare populations along the margins of the Indian Ocean to ones along the margins of the Pacific Ocean, they have very different genetic signatures. Uh, this is from both mitochondrial and nuclear DNA. And we see this in multiple different organisms. And the reason we think this is happening is from uh, ice ages, because as glaciers were building up on land, um, all of that water is coming from the ocean. So as glaciers keep growing on land, sea levels keep dropping and dropping, and they drop by about 120 to 130 meters. And when that happens, the Sunda Shelf and the Sahul Shelf become completely exposed. They're terrestrial environments. And the seaways of the uh, area that is now the Coral Triangle become much more constricted limiting water flow between the Pacific and Indian Ocean. And of course, what's in those water are larvae. And the larvae, if they cannot disperse very effectively between these uh, two ocean basins, their genes are not going to move. And those populations will eventually begin to uh, diverge over time. The other pattern that we see um, is that we have divergence across a, a region called the Maluku Sea, and we see this, uh, you know, we've seen this in about a dozen stomatopods and multiple clownfish. Uh, we see this uh, also in one species of, of giant clam. Uh, this is the boring giant clam because it bores into the coral reef, not because it's uninteresting. It's actually a very interesting clam. Um, but uh, what we see is this is the Maluku Sea region here. And if we look at um, uh, stomatopods, what we see is that you know, populations from Sulawesi and Borneo uh, and, you know, and other species, we've got data that goes way over here, um, but they're very, very different than what you see in this region of Western Papua and Halmahera. And you know, there's some sort of filter to dispersal. Um, and as, as Jermid said, you know, I, like, I studied frogs, you know, I studied, like, frogs in mountain islands. I've never taken a marine course in anything. Um, I knew nothing about oceanography, and so I was originally really perplexed by this. It's like, why would there be, you know, divergence in so many taxa at this one little spot? And then I started learning more about oceanography of this region, and what I learned is that there's a current called the New Guinea Coastal Current that travels along the northern shores of the island of Papua and that's retroflected in this region of Halmahera. And you can see that here in this animation where you, know, you keep seeing this water shoot off out into uh, the Pacific Ocean. And you know, again, if this water from here is not making it across the Maluku Sea, the larvae entrained in that water are not making it across the Maluku Sea. Their genes don't make it across the Maluku Sea, and you begin to see um, isolation. So the third pattern that we've seen um, is essentially they got both patterns. Um, some species have just one or the other. Uh, a number of species actually have both. Uh, so here is the, the boring giant clam here where the Indian Ocean populations have uh, one set of genotypes. Through the Philippines and central Indonesia, there's another set. And then once you get on to, into uh, uh, Papua, then we get uh, the, the third uh, sets of, of genotypes. And there, there is mixing that's going on. This isn't you know, uh, 
It's the, the patterns aren't perfect, but you know, this is the sort of patterns that we see over and over. And you know, we see it in a variety of different data sets. Um, so we've done mitochondrial DNA, we've done nuclear DNA, uh, like nuclear single copy uh, studies. Uh, this is some microsatellite data. Uh, the interesting thing from the microsats of, of the giant clams is that it actually showed that we have three distinct regions, but it picks out the Philippines and uh, this region of Telec Chenderwasi, the, the Bay of the Bird of Paradise, uh, as distinct regions, and that in the central part of Indonesia, this is uh, an admixture zone uh, where populations from where larvae from the, the Philippines and the Bay of Chenderwasi uh, are essentially mixing. Now, uh, another pattern that we see frequently is we, we do see in a number of species isolation in this Bay of Chenderwasi. Uh, there's been, I think now, somewhere around two dozen uh, local endemic fishes that have been described uh, from that region. Uh, if we look at you know, uh, mantis shrimp, and uh, this is the chocolate chip cookie star for, I hope, obvious reasons. Um, you know, uh, even pelagic fish like this uh, Indian scad mackerel. Uh, you know, if you look at this region of Telec Chandrawasi, you see these very distinct populations. And we think, again, that this has to do with um, sea level fluctuations, because if you look at what happens, uh, you know, this is a model of what this area looked like uh, three million years ago uh, as sea levels first started to drop. Uh, you know, the entire bay gets almost entirely closed off and, uh, you know, providing a, a, a reasonable mechanism for how this region would have uh, diverged. Now, as we've moved forward with this research, we've uh, collaborated with a, a number of, of really uh, talented uh, young scientists, uh, Jonathan Kuhl and Eric Tremel. Uh, who do uh, coupled biophysical modeling. Uh, you know, I know my strengths and weaknesses, and I'll leave this to people who are good at it. Um, and uh, what they can do is they can, uh, from satellite maps, create very accurate uh, layers that represent the locations of, of coral reefs uh, throughout the world, but in this case we're looking at the Coral Triangle. And then through data from NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab, they can create a two-dimensional flow field that interacts with that geography. And they can release virtual larvae into virtual oceans and look at their virtual dispersal. And uh, the red here indicates high probability of dispersal. Blue means low probability. And you know, what you see is that, uh, so you know, if you look here at the, the uh, Telec Chandrawasi region, what you see is that the larvae, you know, maybe some of them make it out you know, to the western part of Papua, but those larvae aren't really going very far. And you can look at dispersal probabilities among any given population uh, that you're interested in and you know, create, this is a one generation dispersal probability matrix. And the reason that this diagonal uh, you know, jumps out at you is because on average, you know, things go nowhere. On average, you know, most things that are recruiting in a local population were generated there. They were reproduced there. But, there are some areas of this graph, like here, where we see you know, a larvae that was uh, generated in uh, Makassar on the southern coast of, of um, Sulawesi, making it up uh, down in Flores. So what you can do is you can integrate this over hundreds and thousands of generations and over many different species. So this is what Eric Tremel did in a paper that he published last year where he modeled the dispersal of three different um, uh, coral reef uh, inhabitants and you know, gave them very realistic pelagic larval durations, behaviors, mortalities that are all, uh, the, the models are fed by this ecological data. 
And then he basically summarized uh, these dispersal corridors, uh, these connectivity uh, heat maps. And you know, red means high, blue means low. And so what we see is you know, there are regions, uh, sort of like the Philippines and the central part of Indonesia here, where there's high connectivity. There's low connectivity between the central part of Indonesia and the Philippines and populations to the west. There's low connectivity across the Halmahera uh, Sea. And there's relatively limited connectivity between the western shores of Papua and Telek Chandrawasi, all things that we see in the genetic data. So um, this gives us a lot of confidence, both in our genetic data as well as this model, because there's no reason to believe a priori that they would have come out with the same answer. And um, Eric and Jonathan have taken two different approaches to modeling, uh, one being a uh, 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 Eulerian model, another being an individual-based model, and they all come out with the, the exact same thing. Uh, so that's uh, very reassuring. Um, one of the interesting things that's come up uh, with, with two of my grad students who sort of stumbled upon this independently, working in two different systems, one uh, studying um, coralivorous snails, the other studying uh, coralivorous uh, nudibranchs. Um, what they found is that if you look at the coral hosts, and this, this is data from uh, the, the snails, uh, Coralophilia violaceae, um, but if you look at the variety of different coral hosts that they're found on, and you look at the evolutionary relationships of these hosts, what you see is that there's two very different clades. If you then look at the genetic structure within the snails, what you see is whether you're looking at mitochondrial DNA or um, uh, thousands of, of SNPs, that these snails are diverging based on the host. And we've collected them across Indonesia, across regions where we have data suggesting you know, very strong filters to larval dispersal. And there's more structure across coral hosts than there is across geography, suggesting that these are diverging because of ecological specialization as opposed to uh, allopatric divergence, what we, which is what we've been looking at up until this point. So going back to the story about the evolution of biodiversity in the Coral Triangle, um, we've got a lot of data now that suggests that, that this is a, a center of origin, or it can be a center of origin for many taxa. And you know, there's divergence because of exposure of the Sunda Shelf, uh, because of the closure of the Bay of Chandrawasi, uh, because of the physical oceanography of this region, as well as uh, ecological divergence uh, due to strong uh, host uh, predator associations. Now that doesn't mean that other things aren't going on. Uh, we also have data. Uh, so uh, from this uh, damselfish here, uh, where we've done a transect running from out in the Pacific Ocean into the heart of the Coral Triangle and out onto the western shores of Sumatra. And what we see is that you know, each of these regions is distinct and the oldest populations are out in the Pacific and they get progressively younger as you move into the Coral Triangle and the youngest populations um, are uh, in the western part of Sumatra. So this is exactly what you would see in the center of accumulation. And in reality, there's, you know, there's going to be pluralist, pluralistic origins uh, of this pattern. So uh, you know, if we look over all the studies that have been done, there's evidence for center of origin, there's, center of, there's evidence for center of accumulation, center of overlap. And you know, because this is the largest region of coral reef in the world, uh, you know, it's going to have lower extinction rates. And so people have also talked about this as a, as a center of survival. Um, so what is, what is this, you know, how does knowing this help us uh, address this pattern here? Well, the first thing is that you know, this region here, and we're sort of summarizing the, the phylogeographic patterns that we've seen across 50 species. Um, you know, 
it'll take you a six hour plane ride to go from here to here. So this is broader in geographic expanse than the US and so we need to develop regional management strategies and break this up into smaller units. No one would ever say, you know, we need to have a national management plan for whatever species you're looking at. You'd say, no, okay, we need to break it up into small manageable regions. Um, and that's in fact what people have done. Uh, this is a regional uh, priori prioritization exercise uh, that our data helped feed. Um, breaking the coral triangle up into smaller management zones. Um, these models can be used to show, uh, you know, to help break it up into management zones, but also, you know, we can predict where there are higher levels of connectivity. So um, we can, you know, use these models to help site marine reserves so that, you know, we can protect good sources for downstream uh, populations um, rather than necessarily, you know, protecting sinks, you know, because we want, we want to protect places that are going to continue to seed large areas of downstream habitat. We can do these interesting jackknifing exercises where we'll remove an individual population and we will see the change that it has on overall levels of self-recruitment in the data set. And so this is data for two corals based on microsatellites. And what we're seeing here is that, you know, if the population from Mon Mon or Mawara uh, is removed from the data set, it doesn't really change overall connectivity patterns among the rest of the populations. But if you go to Ambi and these populations are removed, the overall level of self-recruitment in the remaining populations goes up a lot. And what that's telling us is that this is a very critical stepping stone for maintaining connectivity among these populations. And it's a way where we can analytically, you know, test the impacts of local extinctions of individual coral reef ecosystems. There's also been some more traditional ways um, that our work has uh, influenced conservation. Uh, shark finning is a, 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 big era, uh, a big problem for Indonesia, uh, particularly poaching of, of sharks for fins that go into the, uh, the shark fin trade for soup up in um, Hong Kong and, and China. And uh, one of the students, Indonesian students working with us, and, uh, Andre Andreas Sebering, um, did a very simple DNA barcoding project of, of shark fins. Uh, nothing novel in that, that it actually, the first person to do that did it about a decade earlier. Um, but was, what was really remarkable about this study is that they basically found um, that reef sharks have been lo largely extirpated. Reef sharks only comprised about 5% of the fins that were being uh, sold uh, into the shark fin trade, despite the fact that they're much easier and closer to access than pelagic sharks. And so the reason that, that they're in such low frequency isn't because they're being overlooked for uh, a, a higher priced target, it's because they aren't there anymore and they can't be harvested. And uh, observations in these reefs actually confirm that. Um, but one of the disturbing things that they found is that you know, thresher sharks and hammerhead sharks were the primary targets. And, you know, 9% of the fins that we saw in the study were coming from, you know, scalloped hammerheads. The Indonesian government doesn't provide any protection for them because according to the Indonesian government, they didn't exist in Indonesia. And this data actually resulted in legislation being passed in Indonesia that granted uh, protection through a complete moratorium of the capture or sale or trade of, of either great or scalloped hammerhead shark products in Indonesia. So very direct conservation impact um, of this work. One of the things that we're, we're focusing on now is a new project where we're using these things called autonomous reef monitoring structures, which are basically these stacks of PVC plates that get encrusted by uh, 
uh, you know, a variety of different uh, marine organisms, and we can uh, take the biodiversity off of these after they've been in the water for three years and separate all the mobile things and photo document them and voucher them uh, and DNA barcode them. Uh, we can scrape everything off of these plates and put it in a blender, uh, throw it on a, an alumina and uh, do meta barcoding on it and document what diversity is there, both in terms of metazoans and you get a variety of different things, you know, mostly uh, you know, lots and lots of arthropods. Uh, but we're looking at metazoan diversity as well as microbial uh, diversity. So, you know, you can look at a variety of different types of microbes and, and, and characterize the communities that you see. Um, and what we're trying to do at this point is sort of move beyond these phylogeographic pro projects and try to under, better understand um, processes governing the assembly of coral reef diversity in the Coral Triangle. Um, you know, all of these patterns that I showed you are, come from fish, corals, and snails. And, you know, is this small taxonomic sampling really representative of all the diversity of metazoans? We don't know, um, but we will uh, in another year or so. Um, we don't know whether diversity here is higher because on a square meter by square meter comparison, alpha diversity is higher, or whether it's just large enough that beta diversity is higher. We don't know that. Um, but this project is going to help us uh, understand. We have no idea how diversity of metazoan scales with diversity of viruses and microbes, or what sort of associations there may be between these microbial and viral communities and these larger metazoan communities. And one of the things that I'm really excited about with this project is, is looking at how um, biodiversity is changing with uh, habitat degradation. You know, we don't know if there's a linear response. We don't know if a very little amount of stress results in a lot of loss of diversity. We don't know if the populations will be stable for a while and reach a tipping point before they start declining. We don't know these things. But what we want to do is by looking at changes in diversity across anthropogenic stress gradients, we can see how diversity changes. And then by figuring out what organisms are really sensitive to that diversity, or to the anthropogenic stressors, we can start using those taxa as early indicators of reefs that, that may be in trouble so that people can start to intervene before we have to think about um, rehabilitation. If we just stop, if we stop the damage before it occurs, we'll be in better shape. So um, this is what we've been doing over the years in terms of studying marine biodiversity. Um, but I think what's really important to talk about as well is how we do this. Um, because we could do this where we're just focusing on our science, but um, there's a big problem in, in science that I think most people are aware of. You know, if we look at the US population compared to the STEM workforce, women are, are greatly underrepresented. If we look at it from uh, an ethnicity perspective, uh, you know, blacks, Hispanics are heavily underrepresented in the STEM workforce in comparison to the national population as a whole. Uh, it gets even worse if you look at marine science, where black and Hispanics are just such a small minority uh, of marine science. And it's not getting any better. Um, this is data from NSF where they basically looked at the number of degree completions at the bachelor's level or at the doctor, doctorate level um, over you know, the last 20 years or so. And you know, there's an increase in Caucasians getting bachelor's degrees, uh, increase in Caucasians getting doctoral degrees. Um, but you know, the underrepresented minorities just aren't changing. It's flatlined. And you know, if I think about my own history getting involved in marine science, you know, I always loved uh, biology. I always loved animals. Uh, I grew up watching, you know, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, where they went around the world on the Calypso. 
and saw all these amazing places. Um, but, you know, I, I, I come from a, a Hispanic household. Um, I remember shopping uh, with food stamps uh, very early on in my life with my mom. Uh, I went to a high school that uh, was visited by Army recruiters, uh, Marine recruiters, Air Force recruiters. Uh, we were too far from the ocean, so no one from the Navy ever came. Um, but we were never visited by, by uh, college recruiters because, you know, only about 40% of our senior, graduate, or, or senior class would graduate and very few ever went to college. I bet there's more people in my school that went to prison than college. Um, and, um, you know, I couldn't afford to, to go anywhere other than the University of Arizona. So I, that's where I did my undergraduate degree. Um, and because I worked at the University of Arizona, you know, I got exposed to these canyon tree frogs. And, you know, an undergraduate project that exposed me to these canyon tree frogs turned into a PhD thesis. And the only reason I ever started studying marine science was a complete accident. You know, uh, you know I would have continued stay, you know, I, I, my PhD was on, on frogs. I'm a herpetologist, you know, I'm not a marine scientist. And um, you know, it was just an accident that I got involved in this collaboration. And it was a bigger accident that it, when I was applying for postdoctoral fellowships, you know, a program officer basically forced my hand so that the only preliminary data that I could really write a proposal around was based on these stomatopods and this little side project that I got involved with, you know, eventually became my career. And, you know, that's why now, you know, my son, you know, he's been, he's grown up in the ocean. He's grown up exposed to these things. But this isn't what's happening for most people. You know, like, it was just an accident that I'm here talking about marine biodiversity. Um, you know, I could have been talking about frogs, or maybe if I'd done frogs, I'd never gotten a job. Who knows? Um, but, you know, if we think about this problem and why there's so, so few blacks and Hispanics engaged in marine science, you know, it really uh, boils down to an exposure problem in some cases. So here's the demographics of California, um, lots of blacks and Hispanics. Here's the demographics of La Jolla, a little coastal community that's home to the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. That looks very different than this. And so if these students aren't getting exposed to marine environments, like I wasn't exposed to marine environments, they're not going to get into marine science unless some happy accident happens to them like it did for me. Um, with blacks, it's a very different story. It's not just a lack of exposure. It was, they, were, they were completely excluded from uh, swimming pools and from beaches uh, up and you know, through the, the 60s. And the impact of that is still seen today, where if you look at drowning rates, this is blacks here, this is Hispanics and whites. And the reason it drops off so sharply for Hispanics and whites is that they take their kids to the pool and give them swimming lessons. Doesn't happen for African Americans because there's this lingering generational effect where, you know, no, we don't go to pools, you know, because they were never welcome there before. And because of that, you have people who are avoiding marine science. And so uh, I decided I wanted to address this problem and I developed a, a, a program called the Diversity Project. And it's designed to be a transformative project, where a transformative experience where we train them to be scientific divers. Uh, we tr take them to amazing places like Bali and uh, Morea, French Polynesia, working on our sea legs there. Um, you know, and we, we get them in the water. And um, they go out there. They do research with us. And they see. Uh, the amazing coral reefs, that's not such an amazing reef, but you know, this is a little bit better. Um, they see these marine environments, they, they're put to work, they become part of our research team. And you know, they get to experience these things that they'd never get to experience otherwise. And you know, they, they have an amazing time doing it. We don't just take them to nice warm coral reefs, we stick them in, in cold kelp forests as well, so they get a a diversity of experiences. We take them diving in uh, aquaria. 
Uh, so we had an educational program here with a local school. We teach them the lab work. And um, you know, if we look at the impact of this program and you know, look at the, the demographics. So most of our students uh, end up being women. Uh, it's just because that's you know, more women apply than men. Uh, they're mostly black and Hispanic. Uh, there's a lot of mixed race as well. And if you look at the impacts through sort of self-assessment, you know, they think that you know, they gain knowledge about biodiversity and they learn valuable knowledge and skills. Um, you know, it increases their desire to uh, pursue a career in science and to pursue grad school, uh, makes them more competitive for grad school. You know, and, and that's good. We want them to feel good about their experience. But, but what I really care about is what impact does it actually make? And so if you look, uh, at this point, we've had 41 students go through the program. Uh, all but one has stayed in science. Uh, so that's good. Uh, if we look at um, uh, whether they go into graduate school, you know, we've got over 65% of our students are in or have completed uh, graduate school programs. We've got a lot of students that are applying to these programs. And, you know, today we have six alumni who have PhDs, um, uh, you know, three master's degrees. Some of those have continued on for PhDs, three Fulbright recipients, eight uh, uh, NSF uh, pre-docs, almost half are still active in marine science, so, so this is great. And so, you know, if we look at, you know, the impact, I mean, all of these, all of these faces here, all of these are people that have PhDs in marine science that might have never have done that had they not had this experience. So, if we look at this pattern and, and we use our research on this pattern in the right way, we can uh, help with the conservation problem and collect data so that we don't end up with reefs like this and we end up with reefs like this. But if we do it in the right way, we can also change this. And um, we can increase diversity in the sciences. And so great science gets done. We build diversity in the sciences and everyone wins. Thank you. So, so we actually have, I could go back to the talk I gave in 2006 here, where uh, with all those stomatopods that we looked at the, the divergence across the Maluku Sea, uh, we timed the divergence. And if you look at the uh, geological evolution of that region, um, it's very, very active. And really the Halmahera Seaway starts to be pinched off at 5 million years ago, and that's the, the geological position of the island contributes to the formation of the eddy. Part of it's also just that there's so much water trying to be drained from the Pacific that not all of it can get through, so some of it gets turned around anyway. But almost all of our divergence points were within one million years of, of five million. And so there, there was a strong temporal signal in terms of the geologic evolution and the divergence of those populations. I've got a question about, sure. about your students. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed by that, trans, that transition rate or, or success rate in, in your students in the, in the of science. How much time did you have to spend talking to their parents? So I, I don't, uh, so I, I, I engage the parents uh, more now than I used to. I used to never engage them. It never actually occurred to me to engage their parents until I talked with some people about the importance of engaging students' parents, and it made sense that, that I should. Um, so what, what I do now is, 
um, both because I've had parents in the past like contact me saying, I haven't heard from so and so in like you know two months. Is she okay? And it's like yes, she's fine. Um, but uh, what I do is I actually send updates uh, from from the field. I, I, I connect with the parents, uh, you know, just through email before the program, and and you know I thank them for you know allowing me to work with their sons and daughters, and I send them pictures and keep them updated, and you know talk to them after the program. And um, I actually know programs where they'll they'll fly the, the parents in for a couple of days uh, at the beginning or the end of, of the program. Um, we don't have the funding to do that, but it is something that I'd like to get the funding to do because with a lot of these communities, uh, you know, a big part of why these students might get uh, diverted away from basic sciences and towards medicine or something like that is because uh, you know, the parents may think that it's, it's a more secure uh, line of employment. Um, so uh, it's something that, that we really want to do, uh, and hopefully we can do in the future. Uh, retention against the medical school fraction is very impressive. <laughs> yeah. Could you say something about the methods that you use to teach the students in the program? Um, so the, the interesting story there is I've had a lot of people that say that they have trouble, and um, I've never had any trouble because I, I show up. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go and visit schools. Uh, I'll participate in, uh, you know, like on Saturday I go to the uh, American Association of Limnology and Oceanography. Uh, I didn't say that in the right order, but um, anyway, uh, I participate in their mentoring program for underrepresented students, and so I've I've built up a really good network of faculty contacts that you know I can write them and say you know we're running this again make sure your best students know about it um, and several years ago I actually stopped advertising the program because we had gotten to the point where we we're having 90 applications for three slots and at that point I saw it as being more detrimental to the 87 students that hear no than beneficial to the three that get the yes. And so um, I haven't advertised it as much. Um, you know, I, I try to work with closely with my faculty colleagues at different institutions to identify people who th they think are, are, are promising. Um, but yeah, if, if we had the manpower and the funding to you know, support 80 students in the summer, we could get 80 students, I guarantee it. Um, but you know, a, a big part of the success, I mean, I th think we'll, we're, we've grown from two to nine. So not, well, probably have 10 this year actually. But um, a, a big part of it is that you know, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, it's like I spend um, just, you know, I'll spend you know, weeks and weeks.